This is a spoiler warning, you insignificant worms. So take heed, for I am Baal Zaman, Heart of the Dark. The lowly mortal who creates this content has read the series cover to cover, book to book, many, many times. He will be discussing everything he can think of, irrelevant, relevant, regardless. So... Take heed of my warning. If you have not read the series all the way through and spoil something for yourself, well, who is to blame, listener? Not I. Not I. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Gleeman Radio, your daily dose of the Wheel of Time. I'm your host, Tom, and today we are going to be starting episode 3 of the Return to the Wheel of Time podcast, the Eye of the World reread with chapter 2, Strangers. Oh my goodness, guys. I am so, so very excited. The only thing I remember absolutely about this chapter is we get a little annoying little dude, Ewan Thingar. And then we get more rain and land, and I'm super excited about it! I don't remember if Perrin and Egwene are introduced in this episode yet. Uh, this chapter, this episode, goodness. Yeah, I don't remember if Egwene and Perrin are introduced in this chapter yet. We'll have to see. Uh, I'm gonna be jumping right in in a minute now. I just, I wanted to make this intro before I did the chapter, because I think it'll be interesting to see what I remember and what I don't. But before we jump into that, let's just do a brief recap of what happened last time on the Return to the Wheel of Time. We did Chapter 1, An Empty Road. We had Rand and Tam and the hero of the story, Bella, heading into Emmons Field. Rand gets scared off by a Murdral, but Bella stands strong. Not to mention that we finally meet Matt Coffin in the flesh in Chapter 1. That is correct. My buddy there gets that first introduction before any of the other characters in Emmons Field. Uh, the only one that gets introduced first is, uh, oh god, Brand, Brandel and now we are, and Wit Conger and Days Conger. We get two Congers before Matt, now that I think about it, that is not cool at all. Anyways, the chapter ended with Matt actually doing work before Perrin got, uh, god damn it. (laughs) Before Rand got into motion, which I still think is hilarious. To any of you who call Matt a layabout and a lazy shit and all that, he was working first. (laughs) Okay, I'm rambling and I'd really prefer to do that at the end of the episode rather than the beginning. So without further ado, let's just jump right into Chapter 2, Strangers. Her name is Moraine, Ewan said in the momentary silence. I heard him say it. Moraine, he called her. The Lady Moraine. His name is Lan. The Wisdom may not like her, but I do. All right, all right. You know, I was really excited for this chapter because of the introduction of Moraine and Lan, two of my favorite characters uh, going through all of the books. They are definitely in my top ten favorite Wheel of Time characters, and Moraine is in my top five favorite Aes Sedai of all time. I mean, the only one that can really challenge Moraine for me is either uh, Varen or Cadswain. Uh, I don't really count Egwene, I need even a late. They're still so young. I'm. They're in the Aes Sedai ranks, but let's be honest, most of the other Aes Sedai don't really see them as Aes Sedai. And Egwene went from accepted to Amerlin. So let's just let, you know, I, the, my favorite Aes Sedai are my favorite Aes Sedai. Let's not bicker here <laughs> to no one in particular. Uh, so, yeah, Egwene and Perrin were not mentioned, uh, uh, not introduced. 
So they're going to be, as, I guess they're going to be in Chapter 3, or at least I definitely believe Perrin is going to be in Chapter 3. Maybe Egwene won't show up until Chapter 4, the Gleeman. Uh, anyway, so everybody is moving forward. Rand is finally done being lazy and decides to help Matt with bringing the casks in. Uh, and they're, uh, they're heading through the common room and the village council is meeting up. And Rand kind of like slows down because Harald Lujan is giving them a look and he's all confused. Like, did, did I do something? And then Matt just kicks him in the ankle and he's like, let's go, dude, let's go. Uh, because Matt obviously did something wrong. I, I, I'm not going to lie. This, this chapter doesn't look good for Matt. Matt is entertaining through the whole chapter, but this chapter does not look good for Matt. You know what I mean? So they're heading down to the cellar, and before that, they meet uh, Mistress Alvere, Egwene's mother, and Brandelwyn Alvere's wife. And uh, they, they make a. She's not. She's briefly introduced. I don't think she's too much in this book. I don't really think you get to know her very well until book four. Uh, but she's described as a lovely woman with, like, graying hair, and that she's the best chef in the two rivers. And that Rand feels really comfortable about her, around her because she's, like, the only good wife in all of Emmons Field that doesn't hound him about Tam getting remarried or maybe I have this cousin or my sister or my, you know, so she's the only one that doesn't really give Rand problems about Tam or his living situation. But, you know, that might be just because she already expects him to be her son-in-law. So she's like, ah, oh, he's handled. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the boys head down into uh the the cellar and they start putting the casks away and that's when rand's like what, what what the hell did you do why is master luhan so mad why are you avoiding him matt this guy is huge are you did you what did you do what did you do and matt's like nothing nothing i just okay like the snot-nosed village kids i don't remember all their names there were so many one of them was probably you and fingar and i think he mentioned another one was a copland kid so uh, he's like, nothing, I was just telling him about a farmer out in the woods, saw some ghost hounds breathing fire, <laughs> like, what? Breathing fire and running through the woods, that's, 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 that's great, so they kind of ate it up, and they started, uh, looking for it, and they're getting a little suspicious, and Matt's like, well, I gotta cover my tracks, so he goes to the Luhans and takes their dogs and flowers them. And then he releases him near, I think he says, Dab's house. So one of the kids. And he's like, how was I supposed to know it would run straight home? I mean, and it's not my fault Mistress Luhan kept the door open. And it's just like, oh, God, Matt, no. Oh, no, you didn't. And I love how Rand's just like, I wouldn't be as worried about Mistress Luhan, uh, about uh, Master Luhan. I'd be more worried about Mistress Luhan because she's got a bigger temper than bigger temper than her husband, and she's almost as big and strong. And that was that was hilarious. Matt gave this little antidote about apparently she chased the dogs and Harl Luhan out of the house with a frying pan. It was it was a very entertaining scene. So they're going back up and down the stairs, getting rid of the casks, and uh, they do get into the honey cakes. Mr. Salvier said she left them all out, and she never know boys of any age who weren't hungry. <laughs> oh, I'm a little overweight, and uh, I kind of want something more to eat. I had breakfast, but I... what about second breakfast? Oh, that's the wrong series. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, so they get the honey cakes, they finish everything up, and that's when uh, Ewan Fingar runs into the cellar. I guess he learned they were there. He saw them across the town while they were, uh, you know, loading the carts and bringing them down. And he's like, oh, my God, people, there are strangers in town. You know, and it was the thing Matt was starting to bring up in the last chapter. Uh, but, like, they interrupt again. So every time someone tries to talk about the strangers... <laughs> Oh, they're like, is it a man in black? Are they wearing a cloak? Couldn't you see their face? And I love how uh, Ewan's just like, of course I can see their 
face. I mean, his cloak changes color, you know, depending on whatever he's standing in front of. It's really kind of weird, but I haven't really seen it be black yet. And uh, his face is all stony, and he wears a sword, and she's beautiful and wearing like like yeah, it's it's great. I like they're they're uh, <laughs> they're he's just going on, and I love how uh, Matt just starts talking over you into. Uh, uh, Rand. It just seems very real to life. He's excited telling his, uh, you know, the older boys stuff, and they're just like, yeah, 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 whatever, kid. Oh, by the way, <laughs> they just, they just, they just roll over him, and I think it is hilarious. I love how, uh, Matt's talking about him, too. And he's like, yeah, you know what? He's kind of right. You know, Lan is pretty crazy. Uh, he makes look, the merchant guards that come into town look like cur dogs. And Moraine is impressing everybody, and he's a little bit upset because he has to repeat Fingar, and he's like, yeah, she looks like a high-born lady. And yeah. This is the perfect time to talk about Nynaeve, because this is when the boys start discussing Nynaeve. And I love how she's like the most talked about person in town in these first two episodes, uh, chapters. I, these are episodes, whatever. Uh, <laughs> my podcasts are episodes. Uh, Nynaeve is talked about by the village council, by the adults, like the true, true adults, in chapter one. We get Wit, Conger, and Senbui? Yeah, I was going to say Billy All Die, but that's not the right one. Senbui complaining about her. She's too young. She's not listening to the wind well enough. Blah, blah, blah. She's got a temper. Uh, and then you got Tam and Bran defending her in the first uh, chapter. And you kind of get the, the, the idea that Tam and Bran kind of really respect Nynaeve, if not always agree with her decisions. Uh, and Nynaeve is one of my favorite characters in The Wheel of Time. She's one of my favorite female characters, definitely. Uh, I do like her more than Egwene. I really like Egwene, uh, but she doesn't become a great character, in my opinion, until she becomes Amarlin. She's a good character. She becomes Amarlin. She becomes a great character. But Egwene herself, there's some decisions she makes that just frustrates me. The way she, like, treats Matt and Rand and Perrin, um, you know, the way she talks about Matt being a rule breaker and a rogue and how he never does what he's supposed to and how he's always breaking the rules, but then the second she wants to learn some information that may not even be important, she just wants to know it. She'll break whatever the hell rules she wants to. Uh, you know, that kind of frustrates me, but Nynaeve is one of my favorites. And Nynaeve doesn't get a lot of love in the community, I don't think. I've never been to a Rand Con, uh, a Dragon Con, or Jordan Con, or I, I want to go eventually. So I've never actually met too many people in person, in real life, you know, that read The Wheel of Time. But from everything I've heard, she gets a lot of hate. And that's kind of because of her temper, and her arrogance, and her pride, but... Mostly her temper, and I just want to point out what the boys talk about her in this segment. You know, they talk about, you know, why the wisdom's mad. Oh, uh, Moraine accidentally called her child and then corrected herself. So she was kind of mad at Moraine from that, and she's mad at Moraine from then on, which to me is hilarious. You know, and then they're talking about Nynaeve's temper. He's like, you know how she is. The last time someone called her child, it was Sen Bui, and that was last year. And she actually chased him down and hit him with her stick. And he's on the council and old enough to be her grandfather besides, which to me is hilarious. But other people might not find it so. And then that's when Rand says the most important part, in my opinion. Now, you know Nynaeve's temper. She flares up at anything and never stays angry past turning around. That seems actually legitimate for book one, The Eye of the World, Nynaeve. A bit into Great Hunt and then after she gets her block. I need a lot of people to remember that when Nynaeve is at her nastiest, her crankiest, her angriest, she is constantly trying to make herself angry so she can use the one power and protect slash do what she needs to do. Nynaeve is forcing herself into this agitated state for like a third or more of the series. And it gets really frustrating, especially, you know, with all the braid tugging and skirt smoothing and, you know, peevishness. And I, there was a reason for it. And what you see here in the beginning of the series is Nynaeve's true character. 
Oh, yeah, she flares up all the time. But then the next second, she's going to be like, how are you doing? You doing good? All right, I got other stuff to do. You know, she's, 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 she's volatile, but not necessarily raging. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I, I, I just, I always like that. I wanted to take this point to defend her a little bit because she, I know for a fact, once we get on our way to tier or maybe while we're in Tanchico or Gildon or Sal uh, Salidar or especially in Ibudar, she frustrates me. But I understand why she does that. I understand why she's as angry as she is. I just want to take that time and point it out. And now I've been rambling for I don't know how long. Anyways, so they discuss Nynaeve. Um, and I, I can't help but laugh myself off. I'm looking at my notes and, uh, I wrote, ha ha ha. Matt says this is going to be the best bell tine ever epic foreshadowing. <laughs> oh, Matt is just not getting things right in this chapter. Uh, again, I love how they're ignoring you and Fingar. The boys are done. They put everything away. Now it's time to see if the Gleeman's about maybe, but, uh, uh, so they're, they discuss the Gleeman as they're heading out. And I love how Ewan's like, what, what is this? Is this really a gleeman? Is there really a gleeman? There's, this isn't like the ghost hounds, is it? Or the frogs? The frogs? What? Is, why are they leaving this important information out? I want to hear what the hell Matt talked about with the frogs. If he, to entertain himself, talks about ghost hounds breathing fire and flowers, some dogs, I want to know what he did for the frogs. I actually think it would be hilarious if just out of his ass he started describing grom uh golems no not not golems grom's the things you meet in the uh, portal stone and that also the shan chan have that would be hilarious cuz they're described as frogs i don't know i just that caught my attention uh so they leave Ewan's uh Ewan's complaining they get out and then that's when they feel like they're being watched so I'm not really going to lie, I honestly originally thought while I was rereading this chapter that they were being watched by Lan, and he was somewhere nearby, completely like visible if you really, really paid attention, but he was so still that he was just practically invisible, he'd faded into the backdrop, and you know, that was kind of like what I was expecting because I have such high expectations of Lan, you know, like if he coughed, they'd be like, oh my god, you're right behind me, you know, like... <laughs> But, uh, no, instead they look up and it's a raven. Oh, we kind of know what that means. Not only are they the chapter icons, but we also know they're the eyes of the dark one if you're going forward. Uh, and there's no reason you should be in this podcast if, if you haven't read all, all, the whole series. Because if you, if, 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 if you have, I've probably spoiled a bunch of things for you right by now. I'm really, <laughs> really sorry about that. Sorry, I was kind of stumbling because I was looking at my recording and I, for a minute I thought it stopped recording and I was freaking out. Um, yeah, so they see the uh, the ravens and they're kind of pissed. They're like, I'm tired of being watched. And then he looks over and Matt's there and he's like, I hate being watched too. So they pick up stones and they're like, their stones flew true. So they, they had good aim. But then the bird just kind of steps out of the way, which I actually think just probably looked really comical is it weird that i'm imagining pixar animation in my head just this crafty raven with terrifying eyes on a like telephone pole you know it it, it and he just steps over and the rocks miss it's just it's just awful and the boys are just like that's actually really creepy have you ever seen a bird do that no they usually just fly away that's weird and it's still cocking his head and looking at us and that that's my friends is then when we get the introduction Moraine says her first words. A vile bird to be mistrusted in the best of times. And the raven freaks out like he's, ah! And then he flies off and there's feathers going everywhere. I don't know if Moraine used the one power to make it go away. I don't know if it just sensed her and freaked out a little bit and just ran off. I don't know. It sounded, uh, it was amusing to me. It really was. I kind of imagined like the whole squad. It flew away as quick as it can. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I love Moraine. I kind of had a, I've, I've had a little crush on her since I first read the books. And I think I was like 15. So yeah, I've had a crush on her for like, you know, <laughs> 10 plus years. Uh, I, I love Moraine. I love Moraine. Um, anyway, so she's described, she's 
gorgeous. She's dressed in a way they've never seen. You know, she's got this blue cloak that's as bright as the sky, and she's wearing a belt of woven gold. A belt of woven gold, really? Uh, she's got her eye, uh, uh, her serpent ring on, which Rand recognizes. That was interesting. Rand recognized the serpent ring, but not as a symbol of the Aes Sedai, but as a symbol for the cycle of time even older than the wheel, uh, or a symbol of infinity, or like, yeah, it was, wow, it was, it was really kind of cool that he recognized the symbol, but not its current meaning, that's kind of interesting, um, so yeah, so she's wearing her, her, her blue stone, and, uh, you know, she's shorter than everybody, but Rand feels that, like, she's the proper height, and he's the ungangly tall one, which I think is hilarious. I just love how Moraine, like, walks in and has everyone's attention immediately, and all the boys are just like, wow. Uh, like, I think they, uh, there's some inner monologue here of Rand going, like, he felt like her smile was just for him, and he wondered if there was anything he could do for her. Nothing, not not a big deal. Just he wanted to spend more time in her presence, and I'm like, <laughs> me too, Rand. Me too. I would love to meet Moraine. Oh, she's the best. Uh, anyways, so I don't think that's the one power I've heard in other podcasts or on forums or you know whatever. I I, I do look online for a lot of information. Uh, I I I've. I don't think she's using the one power. I think she's just good with mind games. I think she's this gorgeous woman in silks or whatever she's wearing. And I think they're just like, uh, 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 my, my name is, <laughs> you know, they can't, whatever they can do to keep her around. I love how you and Fingar is going to be, Fingar, I, I can speak, I promise. Uh, like runs up to her and he's like, tonight's winter night. It's going to be crazy. Will you come to my house? My mom's made, uh, apple cakes. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, you're trying to bribe her with apple cakes. I love how Moraine's amused by this too. Um, <laughs> but she, yeah, she gets their names. Um, the boys are all embarrassed. They're stumbling over their words, just like I am in this podcast. Uh, they're, uh, Matt, uh, no, it's Rand. No, no, Matt tries to give a bow. <laughs> Matt bows to a, uh, Moraine, which is funny because once Matt comes into his prime, you know, th this guy only bows out of respect, you know? It's, well, you're a lord? Who gives a shit? Oh, you're a lord that actually doing good shit and I kind of respect you? I'll give you a bow. Um, I just love how Matt was the first one to bow, and he does it so awkwardly that Rand's just like, I'm just going to say my name. <laughs> maybe come a, maybe a nod to the head, scratch the forehead. No, no, what how, what do they call it? Maybe knuckle the forehead, you know, give a little nod. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're uh, stumbling over their words. Not as bad as I am. Uh, <laughs> will you go to my house? Mother has apple cakes. I'm going through my notes. Stumbling over words, poor bows, and full embarrassment. And this is when Moraine gives out the coins. She gives Rand and Matt and Ewan Fingar a silver penny, which is described as enough money to buy a horse, a good horse, anywhere in the two rivers, and still have some coin left over, which is ridiculous ridiculous when you think about it right that is a lot of money to just hand off also this kind of makes you realize we never get to see her giving Perrin the coin so how many how many silver pennies did she give away in town because she gave you in one too and I love this is where I think she used the one power for the first time because the boys immediately kind of feel the desire to keep the coin and not spend it, but not you and Fingar. Rand and Matt have this feeling they need to keep it, but Ewan doesn't have that. Do I really can't spend it? Really? But the older boys he kind of looks up to are like, no, we're going to put it away. You can do what you want with your coin, so of course he's going to do the same. But uh, I kind of makes me wonder what that is, and the only thing I can guess about is way later in the series... I don't know if any of you remember during Elaine's succession, which is definitely, definitely not the best part of the books. Uh, it's really, it's really not. I am not looking forward to getting to Elaine's succession. But she's trying to um, 
follow the dark friend that's in her service. I don't remember his name. I freaking hate him. Um, so they get the cut purse that's been a cut purse for like 20 years and he's never gotten caught. And Elaine puts this weave over his like belt buckles and all the metal on him. And what this does is allow her to find them. And I think this is the same weave Moraine used on the coins. I think it had to do with embedding the metal. And once the person has the metal on them, that the uh, channeler can find them. That's the only thing I can think about, because I don't think we ever see anything about it ever again, other than that uh, cut purse. So this is when about the time that Rand nervously asks Moraine, why are you here? Because they've mentioned that they don't get a lot of strangers. I think they said the last stranger that came into Emmons Field, the real stranger. Because most of the peddlers and merchants come there like annually. So a true stranger was some guy coming down from Bear Lawn, and that was like five years ago. And he was hiding from some trouble none of them can understand. Which, to me, I don't know. I My little head canon is that he didn't want to pay taxes or something. And even if he described it to the Two Rivers folk, they're like... Pay who? For what? But I don't understand. Maybe that's why they didn't get it. Maybe he's, maybe he's a white-collar criminal who didn't pay his taxes or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so Rand's got to ask, why are you here, my lady? Because we don't get many people down here. It's like the end of the world, and I suppose people from outside got to think that. He has no idea how true that is. Wait until they see... A town in their eyes go huge. Um, and this is when Moraine, she's very clever because, you know, she can't lie. She's like, I'm a student of history and a collector of old stories. And the two rivers has always fascinated me. And the boys are like, why? Like, like what the hell could have ever happened in the two rivers? I love that's how Matt, who says it, who later has memories of fighting for Minethrin before the dagger, people. Yeah, remember that before the dagger. Um, I love how he's the one that's like, whatever happened here? And this is where I wonder if they're already having a Taveran effect. Because Rand asks, why are you here? And Matt asks, what important happened here? And then she kind of starts talking to herself. And she's like, uh, what was she saying? Um, as the wheel turns, many uh, places go by different names and appearances, just like many people go under different names and appearances, but they're always the same man. And I just, it, is she letting this information slip to see what will happen? Or is she just blurting this information out because two Taviran kind of questioned her, but she's so suave, she just kind of plays it off like she meant to do that. I don't know, it's just very interesting. Uh, I also love how uh, she, she's like, oh, we got to talk later. Take care. Uh, she starts to walk away. And that's when Lan kind of materializes in the doorway of the inn. <laughs> They're like, holy crap, I didn't even see him or smell him or nothing. Like, smell him is weird. He was invisible. Like, it was crazy. Um, they're like, oh, his, sto his face is stony and unlined and he's gray at the temples. That's right, people. Lan has gray at the temples in book one. And I don't think his hair is that much more gray by the end. And Nynaeve is like 26. So Lan is doing great for himself. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> okay, moving on. Oh, I'm almost to the end of my notes. Goody. Uh, oh, yeah, this is where Matt's getting things wrong again. Because Fingar is like, I bet he's a warder. And Matt's like, don't be a fool. Warders spend all their time in the blight. And they're covered in gold and jewels. And did you see any gold and jewels? And are there Trollocs in the two rivers? You're so stupid, you and Fingar. <laughs> oh, how many things is Matt going to get wrong in this chapter? I swear. Bell time's going to be great. There are no Trollocs. Winter night's going to go off without a hitch. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I think, you know what? I think I've gotten through everything. The, the chapter ends with them out there kind of like wistfully watching the gorgeous woman walk away, uh, deciding they need to hold on to their coins. 
Ewan being a little upset about it, but trying to be cool like his uh, elder townsfolk. And that's when we get shouts that the peddler is coming. Ah, <sighs> it sounds so joyous, but when you think about it, he's the most vile, evil piece of crap to ever walk in the world of Wheel of Time. Oh, I'm not looking forward to, and at the same time, looking forward to fame. I don't know. I, this is gonna be this is gonna be interesting. And I think that is it for chapter two. Alrighty, what is this take five or seven or twelve of my outro? Are you serious? Oh, I just want to make it good for you guys, and, and I'm realizing that I just need to just let it go. I really do. If I you have complaints, let me know in the comments below. I hope you're actually having fun with this podcast series, because I am. Uh, this is actually more fun than I thought it would be. Uh, I always marathon through shit. Uh, I keep swearing. Oh my god. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not stopping this time. I'm not. I, I usually marathon through all my book series. Uh, it's uncommon for me to start The Eye of the World and not have it completed within a week. Um, but if I put out one a day and there's like 56 chapters or something like that, it's, I'm going to be in here for a while and it's going to give me a different perspective on the series that I didn't have before. I'm going to be taking it in slowly instead of devouring it all at once. And that's going to be really fun. So it's not just your daily dose of the Wheel of Time. It's mine. And I'm really excited about that. So I think it's time I got out of your hair. But before that, I have a few uh, requests for you guys out there. If there's anything you want me to talk about, put it in the comments below. I've thought about making separate videos uh, where I just discuss different points. Wheel of Time 101, where we're covering like how stuff works, or maybe an in defense of Nynaeve video. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, whatever you want me to talk about it, put it in the comments below, or email me at at GleemanRadio at, no, not at, at GleemanRadio at gmail.com. Um, I tried to do Twitter at GleemanRadio. I think it gave me at Gleeman R, um, but for, it locked me out. I was trying to uh, do the settings, and I was trying to input the age, and I was actually trying to use um, the day I was going to, on Monday when these were going to start out, but then it thought I was a robot, and it won't let me back in without my phone, and I didn't turn on my phone this month because I didn't want to deal with people calling me at the moment because I'm incredibly antisocial. So I, I can't even get back into Twitter. I just got time to put in one post. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyways, if you think you can record my intro better than me, that spoiler warning, uh, by all means, that would be really fun. I would love to hear all your guys' impressions of the Forsaken. I kind of like to have them as a spoiler uh, spoiler warning. I think that's going to be fun. Uh, send that at, at, at Gleeman radio at gmail I, I, i'm gonna put it in there so you can read it um and twitter but i don't know how to get back into it until uh, until next month when i turn my phone back on so <laughs> uh also uh what was the other thing there is not enough wheel of time fan art in this world i i really really believe that so if you're willing to draw something from the series um, hopefully something pertaining to what I'm currently working on, or hell, if it's in the last book, I don't give a crap. Wheel of Time fan art, send it to me at gleemanradio.gmail.com, and hopefully I'll be able to put it up here and give you a shout out for how awesome you are. So take care now. Peace out. I gotta go before I ramble on for an eternity. <laughs>